On today's More Than a Test, we have Jean-Claude Brizard. He's the president and CEO of Digital Promise, but his journey to get there has been long and included many school districts, many positions, but he'll say he's always a teacher. Listen in to learn more about what he believes is going to change the world with technology, education, and the things we should all be investing in. All right. Welcome, Jean-Claude. Thank you so much for being here. Glad, so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to have you. Actually, I've been really excited for this conversation because I met you in December. And if there's one thing I know about you, you are a, are a storyteller. You tell just huh. like magical, magnificent stories. And so I wonder if we can start just by teasing. I would love to end this conversation by asking you to tell the sandwich story. I know I've asked you to tell it before, but can we tell people <laughs> that if they stay till the end, you'll tell the sandwich story one more time? Absolutely. I would love to tell the sandwich story. <laughs> I love it. I try to tell it to people. I don't do it justice. So that would be great. So if you stay till the end, Jean-Claude is going to tell you what I'm going to start calling the famous sandwich story. Um, but, you know, right now what I would love to talk about is Digital Promise. You're the CEO of Digital Promise. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, getting ready for this, I kind of scoured the website, spent a lot of time, and there's a lot of buzzwords. So you tell me from your heart, what, is, what does Digital Promise really do? What are you about? You know, we were created out of an act of Congress to do one big thing, which is um, take research and take technology and practitioners and bring it together in a way that really provides solutions for the nation, for, for the U.S. of A. Our work right now frankly, is national and international. But if you think about this idea of really finding ways of taking learning science research, a lot of practitioners and leveraging sort of emerging technologies and creating a mix that really have the kind of impact that kids are looking for in schools. Okay, so I'm hearing researchers, practitioners, and technology. When you think of those three like stakeholders, who is the hardest to get involved? You know, it's um, right now I think families and folks outside of the traditional system um, tend to be the most difficult uh, to, to get involved. But we understand now that the work is a four-legged stool, right? We say the most important relationship in education is between teachers, students, families, and content. And how will technology augment the intelligence of this particular, of this, this kind of relationship? That is the work, but that fourth leg of the stool, we've never really done well in education, and we've got to keep finding ways of really engaging and centering community in what we do every single day. It's so interesting you say that. At Amira, we just launched a parent portal that we're doing some testing with right now, and we're finding the exact same thing. Even with teacher help, it's really hard to engage with parents. What have you learned so far about this fourth leg of the stool? You know, it's about um, making sure you're centering that voice, right? So uh, making sure communities understand that, that there is such a thing as a content expert and also a thing as a context expert, right? So when you treat community and parents as, as equal partners at the table uh, and you engage them and meet them where they are, then you, you'll have the kind of success you're looking for. If you keep coming at the work from a um, from the sort of hubris perspective, I know the answers, et cetera, you're never going to get through. Um, but engaging parents at that level as true partners in the work um, and leveraging, frankly, people who know how to do this really well. Um, so one of my favorite organizations is Learning Heroes. Um, and if you engage folks at that level who understand how to engage families, then actually the work actually happens. Okay, so finding some organizations who really know how to do this and meeting parents where they are. So where are, where are the parents? You know, like, to be honest, there's a lot of tech products asking this question, like, how do we better engage parents? What do you, what do you think? What do you think is the best way for us to better engage parents? You know, when I was a superintendent, uh, I had a pastor say to me, the parents you're looking for are in my churches every Sunday. If you want to speak to them, come and talk to them. Yeah, diff different cities, different places, different contexts. When I was in Chicago, I spent a lot of my time on Sundays visiting churches and speaking to congregations. Um, sometimes, frankly, it's about going to a particular, so a place where parents aggregate. So these community-led organizations, these community foundations often are great places to find out where parents are and engage them at that level. I mean, we know that in some communities, parents are working two or three jobs, but many of them will go to a particular place, a community center or a church, go to those places and you'll find the parents. Awesome. Thanks for digging a little bit deeper on what that means, because I think a lot of people say things like that, but that really brought it to life for me. Um, okay, so we're talking about these four stools, but when I look at Digital Promise, you all do a, a lot. You were just talking about how you were just at ASU GSV. You, next week, you're in, I think, Alabama for a superintendent's conference. When you think about the things that you do, what are the things that you feel most proud of at Digital Promise? 
you know, what I'm most proud of is the fact that we take things like research and put it into practice. For example, next week in, Al- in Talladega County, Alabama, we're going to visit a school district that really is taking the, the um, science of learning and technology, and they've completely transformed a school system. So when you take 150 superintendents to come and see what it looks like in practice, so you can have the theoretical constructs, you can have all the videos you want, but you go and see and talk to the protagonists on the ground, the students, the teachers, the principals, the parents, you can begin to really understand what it took to get there. So as an organization, we do that really well in connecting research to practice and the practice to inform research as well too, and make those things again actionable for the, for the, for the educator on the ground, for the parents who are educating the young people. Um, we recently had a conversation with the, um, one of the founders of the UCSF Dyslexia Center, and what he said to us was, um, you know, the teachers don't know this, but they are hungry to know it. Like, when you talk about practitioners, like, you t- bring them this information, and they're, they're, they're excited to get this, um, especially when he's talking about the brain research that they're learning about how the brain works and what that looks like with dyslexia. Is that your experience as well? When you bring the research, it's, it, everyone's hungry for it. Like, it feels like we often talk about education like it's so far from the research, and there's this, like, ivory tower of universities and then K-12 schools down here. You know, what's your experience as far as connecting practitioners and research? You know, it, it, that's an important point. You, you've got to make the research usable and actionable. <clears throat> so much of, of what's written in, in, in the literature is written f- for um, other academics, right? So uh, when you look at these massive research conferences, too often they are talking to an audience of researchers and academics, and most academics are not trained to really be in the same space as, as an educator. When you look at, again, research to practice work, very often we don't allow the educator or the parent to be a, a researcher in the process, a leader in the process of identifying what needs to happen. But when I find that you, when you make the work actionable, for example, in a digital promise, we have this thing called the learner variability navigator. It's a long word, right? LVP. It takes a science uh, of, of, of learning, which is again baked into the research, but makes it actionable for the educator. Uh, this this thing gets about 30,000 unique hits a month and it's being integrated into systems that we have in schools. It's going to reach 80 million users next, next, next year. And the webinars that we have on that platform draw a thousand teachers uh, every so often. So for, uh, with Amira, I'll give a very specific example. This week we had a teacher tech conference, 1,500 teachers, mostly U.S., but from as far as as Jordan um, Korea, as, I was there. Yes, yeah. but we had one teacher do a master class, and and she highlighted a mirror learning, uh, and you can see the the excitement in her voice, um, in the video because she made the connection between what we know is research based practice, uh, research based sort of work, and practice. That kind of actionable through line, I think, is really critical for the work. That is really critical. And I, I feel like I keep hearing you say three words that are really close to three words. We say a lot of them, Mira. So I keep hearing you say science of learning, and we talk a lot about science of reading. Are you talking about two things that you think are connected? What, what, why are you saying science of learning when I know science of reading? I, they're both well connected, right? Science of reading is science of learning, right? Uh, for so many people, um, we, a lot of people thought that reading was innate, right? It it just comes naturally. We all know reading is rocket science. Uh, It really is. Um, And and if you don't approach it from a science perspective, you're never going to get kids to learn to read. Um, So understanding that this is a science, uh, there are work that that, that there are methodologies we have to follow. We have to understand the neuroscience. Again, we don't need teachers to become brain experts, but they need to understand what it means for their practice in the classroom, why it is so important to lean on the science or to, to buy products and use products that lean on the science of learning. Awesome. That's so great. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a couple more questions about digital promise. And then I want to talk about how you ended up at digital promise. So my understanding of digital promise, you get to see everything. Like you're getting to see a lot of technology that's coming out and that's like really exciting. When you see that, what, what excites you? When, when do you see something and you're like, oh man, this is big. What, what's, what yeah. turns that on for you? No, if I can say two things, one is that what I love about Digital Promise, to your point, is we see everything, meaning that we work in early learning education, in K-12 education, in post-secondary work, and frankly, workforce development. One of our goals 
is 30 million um, uh, young people in America uh, on a path to economic security. But we also understand that there is a through line here. We have to make sure that we are supporting them, again, through what we know about pedagogy and practice and everything else at early learning K-12 post-secondary. In fact, I just published an article on higher ed gateway courses, i.e. redesigned courses uh, using adaptive technologies that will really push this discussion. So that really excites me that we see the entire elephant, not just parts of it. The other thing too, is we tend to live on the edge of innovation. So when you think about the newest thing that is coming out, the newest learning about how you unlock potential in system, we tend to be there as well too. So we're pulling the sector um, to what we understand around research-based practices. And for me, that is really exciting. We have a Futures Lab concept here, a Futures Lab uh, structure that looks at Horizon 3 work, the next level of work that will pull curriculum and pedagogy. And again, bottom line to address the needs of our young people across the board. Okay, so there's a lot of excitement around technology, but there's also a lot of things that don't go great, right? Like you and I have both been in the classroom. We've both been school leaders, so we've definitely seen the, the dark side. Can you think of a time that Digital Promise was really excited about something and maybe it didn't go the way you expected? You know, I was talking to one of the architects of Digital Promise back in the late 90s uh, who, who co-authored a book that became the organization. And what she said to me was, you know, in those days, we were really excited about technology and media, um, but we never understood that there could be a downside. We didn't see it. Uh, for example, when you, when you look at um, some of the ills that come out of social media, for example, right? So a lot of us didn't have that kind of foresight. Her push on me was looking at AI in education, this craze that uh, perhaps everyone's discovered, we, we know, Laura, that AI has been in education for a long time, but that there they could be a dark side to AI in education around bias. Folks are worried about cheating. We're worried about bias uh, because AI is based on historical data, making sure that the folks doing the work are mitigating bias, understanding the role of the teacher in the classroom. Um, that is an area right now which is of concern. And there's a lesson here that we learned from early days of digital primacy on technology and media. That totally makes sense, and I, I think you're, you're hitting on something that is a lot, a lot of people worried about. All right, the last question I'm going to ask about digital promise, and this is really just your perspective, but I look at all the problems teachers are facing every day, right? It, it changes every day. There's something new that we didn't expect. Is there a problem we should not look to, tech, 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 to technology to solve? Is there something that we should say, this is not for technology? You know, um, let, me, let me perhaps answer your question this way. And I want to go back to the premise that the most important relationship in education is between teachers, students, families, and content. Uh, what I don't want us to lose is that is the core of the work. It is teaching and learning, teaching and learning, learning and teaching, right? Technology is an enabler. It, it is something that allows us to augment the intelligence, right? Relationships are critical and matter, which is why I keep on the relationship between these two, these, these four legged like stool. We can't forget that milieu, that this is where the work is. Technology should not lead, technology should be an enabler and a, and, and a way of augmenting intelligence. That's what I don't want us to focus and to lose because it is the human connection. It is centering the, the teacher, centering the young child, centering the parent in the work that we actually do. That is. The, at the crux of the work, we cannot lose that. That connection. It's interesting that you say that because, and it's a perfect segue to what I'd like to talk about next because, again, we were reviewing your bio, preparing it for today, and one of the things that we noticed, we were looking at all of the things that you've done, and you've done incredible things, run school districts, um, and been at the Gates Foundation, was somewhere very high on your bio, you have 21 years an educator. And when I met you in December at a conference around technology, you spent 75% of the time talking about kids. Is that your path here? You started as a teacher and you just cared about kids and then things, is that, like, that's what it feels like when, I, when I'm around you and when I read about you, but I'm just so curious, is that true? Or was there like a bigger plan that this is what you wanted to do? No, I think, first of all, thank, thank you for that really amazing compliment. Um, teaching wasn't always what I wanted to do. Um, um, I fell into teaching. My parents were teachers. Uh, I always often tell people, you never want to do what your parents do. Um, but, you know, I fell into teaching and I fell in love 
particularly with with teaching and with kids. Um, and in that story on the sandwich which was like my first experience of teaching, which was very difficult, but at the same time very rewarding. I have never forgotten that connection to that to the work and how important that is. Um, and I'll tell you, when my daughter was born um, now 22 years ago, I began to really understand my job as an educator because it was no longer about those kids in the school that I was taking care of. It was about my child. And if my kid wasn't was doing well, then nothing was good in the world. So that really centered me. And to this day, my children is my entry in my thinking on everything we do in education. Okay, that that makes a ton of sense. I have I have three year old twins, and I feel like the exact same thing. When they're not good, I'm not good. So I, I like yes. I like that you said that. So you started out in the classroom. At what point did you decide? Like uh, my role, just so you know, my road of this was like I had a principal I didn't like, and I was like, well, great. If I don't like him, then I need to go do the job. How <laughs> how did you end up deciding maybe not the classroom any longer? So I'll give a lot of credit to a guy named Bob Sarkey, who was my assistant principal. Uh, he said to me, you need to become an administrator. Um, at the time, I had gotten into a PhD program at, at Columbia University and um, couldn't afford to pay for it. He goes, if you become an AP, uh, you'll make more money. You might be able to afford it. And beyond that, he goes, I want you to have greater impact than just the classes you, you're teaching. So he was the catalyst. Uh, and I had a principal named Louis Rappaport, frankly, who gave me a chance as an assistant principal. And, and he just kept kept moving. Um, and again, no hubris, but in New York City, I kept being moved up the ladder. It wasn't that was I was applying for work. Uh, I, I became a principal in the same school. I became an area superintendent, head of high schools, uh, because people at Central Office saw potential and saw perhaps I had something to offer, and they kept offering me jobs uh, up, moving up the ladder in the system. Wow. Okay. I'm going to tell you, I don't think many people have that experience, which I, obviously you're special and amazing in so many ways. But if you were talking to somebody who's either an assistant principal, let's say, and they want to move up the ladder and maybe other people don't see their potential, what advice would you give those people? You know, I always tell people that, that the network you have is critical in terms of moving up. So if you want to be a principal, you know, keep talking to principals and folks who, who supervise principals and the skills and competencies required to do that job. And, and, and in my case, it was my principal and then a woman named Rose DePinto, who was the head of high schools, and then Carmen Farina, who, who became chancellor of schools in New York City, who, who I met, I worked with, demonstrated my capacity and potential, who kept pulling me up the system. So it's hard work, but it's also the network that you're surrounded by, the folks you actually get to know, or are the ones who are going to help you with your career. When you go back to all of these people, are they just so proud of you? They, they are. Um, I mean, sometimes it's embarrassing. Um, many of them, if not all of them, are still alive today. Uh, uh, Louis died a few months ago. Um, whenever I talk to them and I call them for advice, they are often off flawed and say, why are you calling me? You seem to know what, you know what you're doing. You're great. Uh, again, not no hubris here. But at the same time, like Bob Sutty retired many years ago. He now lives in Arizona. I will call him and say, Bob, I'm thinking about the following. What do you think? He was an assistant principal. I became his principal uh, at, at the school I was at in New York City. But these are people I, I, I look to, not just because of their professional content knowledge, but because of who they are as human beings and, and the fact that they see beyond school and they see the needs of young people in the society. So I, I cherish them for who they are. And they're really good at providing support and advice to me to this day. I'm so glad we're digging dig deeper because what you said was, you know, cultivate your network. But what you really meant was keep going back to those people who push you and ask questions and learn from them. Keep learning from the people who did it before you. And that's a relationship that will keep pushing you forward. And I think, I think that's the heart of this, which is so lovely. Okay, so I'm going to ask you two questions about being a principal and then we'll move up. Okay, so as a principal, when you were a principal, which what years were you a principal? <laughs> Wow. Um, I'm going to date myself here. Uh, 1999 to 2003. Okay. So but that, I was a teacher in the same school. <laughs> okay. But that time, were, what was, was there any technology that you thought was really amazing at that time? Yes. Um, so I, lots of examples I can give. In fact, there's an article in my school that was published called, uh, in Chief Information Officer magazine, CIO magazine, on the transformation of a vocational high school 
into a tech-enabled high school. Um, I, it's called A School Grows in Brooklyn. It's an amazing, amazing article. But for me, what I discovered in that school was a veneer set of software probes, hardware and software that transformed the way I taught physics. Uh, I was a chemistry and physics teacher. And I moved away from the cookbook labs. Those of us who remember high school, you know, you do the, all the procedures in chemistry or physics. You do all these cookbook labs and you, and you have no idea what you did. Uh, but this, this software changed and changed the structure where the experimentation lasted three or four minutes or maybe 30 seconds. And the discussion and discovery and the inquiry could last an hour. Um, so we flipped the paradigm. It was all because of a set of probes and software on a Mac 2 <laughs> that really changed the way I taught physics in New York City. And by the way, 90% pass rate on the exams in New York because of that. Okay. And does the software still exist? I know Mac 2s don't. I, I know. I think it does. I think it does. Uh, perhaps quite evolved. Um, but again, those probes in software still exist today. Okay. And then my next principal question, what's the biggest difference from being a school leader to a superintendent? Well, you know, I tell people um, being a high school principal really prepared me for becoming a school, a school superintendent. Um, it's a job on steroids, but it's managing adults, managing systems. The high school principal, the school principal is a, is a mini system, um, whereas a school superintendent is managing a collection of schools and a system. But that was the best preparation I could have had. Just a scale is different. Otherwise, there's a lot of similarities between the two jobs. Oh, good. So there's someone who could be sitting as a principal right now, wishing, hoping to be that someday. And you'd think that they're, they're building the skills they need. Was that your experience as well with technology that you would find something and love it? And just there were either barriers and walls, or it was pretty easy to kind of pick up what, what, what happened for you? So I would say it depends on the system um, in terms of purchasing some systems like New York city, there is some latitude around autonomy, um, but in other systems you don't. But what I have found, so the answer, short answer is yes, there's been all these kinds of barriers around procurement. I have to tell you, it's one innovation, well, it's an area right for innovation, let me put it that way, um, in school districts, because it really creates barriers um, for, for entry for a lot of even smaller companies for that matter, right? Um, but what I found to be really useful, either within systems or across systems, is if you build, if you have a coalition. So when I was in Chicago, for example, as CEO, uh, I had about I don't know, 400 emails my second week on the job from teachers demanding a particular piece of software be purchased. And when I saw that, my response to my, my CTO, my CAO, clearly there's a demand coming from the field. We ought to listen. So I invited some of these folks in my office. We talked. You know what? In six months, we did an adoption. Um, what my push for is simply is that to teachers and principals. Sometimes if you build a coalition, your mass and collective push your weight up the system, you can make things happen. So if the coalition comes to you via 400 emails, listen, but if it doesn't go yes. find the people. All right, let me ask you this. So exactly. next week you're going to be hosting a superintendent's like conference with what is it? Hundreds of superintendents together. Let's say at that conference, there's a new superintendent and they see a technology that they're super excited about. They're, they're new. They're, they're like, this is going to change the game. What, maybe it's a mirror, <laughs> whatever it is. And they want to take it back and they get back and the people underneath them are not for it. They don't have, they don't have people excited about it. They're not sure about funding. What do you think they should do next? If this is what they really think might be a solution, what's the next step? You know, the one thing I often tell systems leaders is you do not want um, what I call malicious compliance right? Which is that you push it and you, you folks, you have to adapt it. You've got to get the buy-in. So maybe to understand which nodes are critical in our district, bringing those folks together, getting a demo to actually happen, right? Um, and get folks excited about the piece of technology and the piece of software against a, a solving a, a, a problem of practice, right? Um, so that kind of cultivation, I think, is important to, to get done. Give you a quick example on that. I had a, an iPad adoption with a piece of software in Chicago. Uh, one of the things I did as, a, as the CEO of the school system, I taught a seventh grade class using the technology. Um, it was, I was teaching the solar system and I had media in the room. So the evening news <laughs> was me on, on television. The next day, the, the local paper, you saw me in there. That was one of the tools that we used to drum up excitement about this particular approach to the work. So... I would, I would say don't underestimate the fact that you've got to 
build uh, excitement around a piece of software. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get malicious compliance. Okay. Yeah, that malicious compliance I'm going to use. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, and that makes sense. And I love that you went back and taught a class. That's so great. Um, all right. Here's, here's a thing, something that I come up against a lot. So I get to a district that has good funding. They have good systems. They've got good people. And then I get to a teacher. And I'm like, hey, how can I help you? And watch, she'll open a child's Chromebook and we'll see 15 icons or 30 icons of just like all the programs that have been thrown at this teacher. And she, she looks at me and she just says like, you tell me, I want to teach. And what they're telling me is somehow I have to find time for all these 30 programs. Have we overdone it in tech? Have we, have we offered too much to teachers? Or what, how, do, how can we help? Because I, especially with the pandemic, when we couldn't have kids in classes, this, this list grew, right? We, the icons grew. And so I'm just so curious. Like, what do you, what do you say to that? You know, I'm, I'm about to publish a paper on Monday on digital transformation. And Laura, that's exactly one of the points we're trying to make that systems often don't have control of what's entering the classroom. And by the way, sometimes it comes from a child or a parent. So it's not just what is happening in a particular teacher's classroom, but it, it, it's a proliferation of ed tech products coming into the classroom. I think the job of, of this system, the CTO, the CAO, is to create coherence. Um, so this is where you need a vision. You need technology leadership at the district level, uh, and frankly, even at the school level, to make sure that what is showing up in, in, in the classroom is coherent. And if, if, if you had interoperable at tech, that would be even more wonderful. This is one set of data connected that folks can actually see. But I think it is a job of the system um, to be perhaps not, 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 a, not, not a gatekeeper, but to build coherence within these things. So there is a vision behind the use of these kinds of technologies. And when I think about certain programs, for example, you see there is a deliberate approach. Um, I know Houghton Mifflin does this, right? A deliberate approach in providing a suite of supports and services so the teacher doesn't have to play general contractor. Um, they, can, they can see the coherence in the work and it gets a particular vision being pushed by the district. That, that makes a lot of sense. I think that, that totally makes sense. All right, here's my last question about being a superintendent. What's the biggest difference between being a superintendent and being the CEO of Digital Promise? Oh, wow. I have a lot less stress <laughs> than being a school superintendent. Um, you know, this is a large nonprofit. We do amazing work. We, we support a lot of superintendents. Um, I don't um, uh, often have to deal with the political nature of the superintendency. It is a tough job, especially in today's um, today's age, uh, what is happening right now, frankly, with the culture wars, um, et cetera. So I really um, feel for these folks. We've got to find ways to support them. Uh, I would even argue principles as well, too. But this job is a lot of fun. We get to play with a lot of stuff and get to serve a lot of superintendents without the political issues. <laughs> And you know, and you don't really ever feel any of like the political pressure. I mean, I feel like we hear this all, your, to your point from superintendents all the time of like, I want to buy this, but there's a political pressure of, for me to do this or to do that or whatever. And, and you're not feeling because I mean, you're kind of a big voice in, in this. You're not kind of you are a big voice and there's no political pressure on you to kind of say something is good or something is bad or any, you don't feel any of that at Digital Promise. We, we, we don't. I mean, we try to be the consumer reports, right, of, of, of this kind of work. What we do feel uh perhaps is the political pressure going into our superintendents and the pressure to support them, to figure out ways of supporting them, to help them with communications, uh, to understand what words will resonate, which words will not resonate, which part you take on, which part you don't take on. That kind of support, we that kind of pressure we feel to make sure that the job is sustainable for superintendents. Um, but our, us ourselves, um, I, I, I can't say, frankly, I can put myself right now in the shoes of the difficult work that our systems and actually are doing right now. I, I totally agree. I, I was talking to a principal on Monday. I was in a school and she said something along the lines of like, Laura, I just need a day. Like, you know, yes. if, if you could just cover me for a day. And I was like, I mean, I'll try, <laughs> you know, but it was, that was all she said. It was like, it's just so much right now. There's so many things. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. So we talked about you as a principal. We talked about you as a district leader. We talked about digital promise. Let's go back and tell the story, the sandwich story, from your first your first kind of experience as a teacher. No, I thank you for, for that opportunity too. So my, my first teaching job, I ended up at, uh, at a place called Rikers Island in New York City um, as a teacher. Um, I'd never heard of Rikers until that moment. And when I got there into that class, um, 
you know, I had the first class I was asked to teach chemistry. It was my license. And found those kids couldn't do basic basic math, basic computation. Um, and make a very long story short, I found one young man who looked just like me, same physical. I'm 6'5", he's a big kid. Um, and we began to do work together. Uh, within a few months, this young man went from uh, struggling to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division to pre-algebra, all in the same semester. Brilliant kid. And we lost him somehow. Uh, toward the end of my my the semester, I said to him, uh, you've brought joy to my life. I hate this place because I was like 21, 22 years of age. Uh, I said, what can I get you? Um, because you brought joy to me here in a place I don't like very much. He said, get me a sandwich. I said, a sandwich. He goes, get me a sandwich. Give me an order that had every deli meat you could ever imagine. This child that because he wanted to work with you, you sat with him, you did the math, he's doing algebra. And, and you say to him, like, I have to give you, like, and I think every teacher feels like this. There are kids who just change us so much that we want to do anything. And so he asks for the sandwich, the stack it's sandwich, it. every deli yes. meat. And so you drive off the island during your lunch to go get yes. the sandwich. And Yes. And, and when, coming back into the island, um, the corrections officers saw the bag. And of course, they had to open to see what was inside. Um, and one said to me, um, I think I know what you're doing. Uh, don't get attached to these kids because they're transients. Um, and I, when I went back to my classroom, I sat there. Of course, these young people are taking off the school floor to their own cafeteria. He never came back. Um, and he was apparently, it took me three days to find this out. He was taken to maximum security by the marshals. Uh, I never saw him again. And I have to tell you, I left the school at the end of that semester because of that. And I went, I went to a middle school in Bushwick, Brooklyn. I said, if I can't fix this, I need to be on the front end. And Laura, that was the beginning of my professional career as a teacher because I did not want to stay in the profession. And I said to myself, okay, I've got to make a difference. If we can lose a young man who could have been a PhD mathematician, um, I've got to try and make a difference. That is was the catalyst for me. And to this day, this was, was back in 1986, in dating myself here. Uh, I have never forgotten that experience. Right, and he was gone. Wow. I, to me, it, like it resonates. It tells I you tell that story, and every single time it gets me, I'm kind of like daring up now, just thinking of 21 year old you, just realizing like this broken system and still wanting to do so much good. And you have done so much good. Um, and I, I, I think, I'm sure if he knew where you were, he would be proud of you. And all of those other mentors that you described earlier are, are probably very proud of you. And so I, we have five questions that we ask at the end of every interview. And the first question is, you know, there's probably someone sitting in a classroom or at a principal's desk thinking they want to do some of what you've done. They want to have the same impact. What advice would you give those people? Well, um, don't negotiate your core values. Understand what those are. If they're about children, don't negotiate that. Uh, things need to be negotiated to move, but don't negotiate your core values and keep talking to those mentors I was talking about. Awesome. Okay, the second one is, tell us about a reading moment in your life. So something that happened with you in a book. You know, um, I have one. I have so many here, but one I'm going to pull out. One of my, uh, this was seminal for me, and I have early ones and late ones. This was perhaps about five years ago. I read this book called Dear America. Uh, it's about the story of an undocumented young man here in the Bay Area. It became a Pulitzer surprise uh, reading author at the Washington Post and managed to stay and do this. So his story I found to be inspirational because my parents at one point were undocumented in this country. So who gave you the book? Um, I was at a meeting listening to him talk. He gave me the book, uh, and I, I believe, no, it's not. Most of the books, my books are autographed. This one is not autographed. <laughs> You'll have to find them again. Okay, so yes. the, the podcast is called More Than a Test, and the reason we call it that at Amira is because we're really trying to move towards the next generation of assessments where we don't look at kids three times a year, but instead we can look at what they do every day as data points to help us like inform teaching and instruction and what that child needs. But for a lot of people, they hear more than a test, and they think about kids, they think about teachers, they think about all kinds of things. When you hear more than a test, what do you think about? I think about really understanding um, the 360 degree view of a child, right? Um, that who is this person I have in front of me? And to your point, it's not about a moment in time. It's the kind of running record stuff that we tend to see in reading or literacy instruction, except that perhaps powered by technology, right? That allows a teacher to do the case conferencing. That again, you see the human being, 
No, I would say that education is human development. Uh, we've got to have the kinds of assessment and the kinds of way of looking at the child that informs practice to that particular lens. That makes sense. Um, okay, and a good segue to my almost last question, second to last, is a piece of technology right now that really excites you. Gosh, so many. AI. I was, let me just speak on AI. Um, I'm a commercial pilot. We use AI uh, in, in, in aviation. Uh, the potential for AI to transform teaching and learning, I think, exists with the caveats, of course, making sure that we mitigate against the bad sides of what could happen with AI. And again, people call it intelligence augmentation. Uh, so IA is what I like to, 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 to talk about, but that really excites me right now. Okay, and I feel like you already told me this because as your reading moment, but I'm going to ask again, what's one book that everyone should read? You know, uh, I would say the audience is, it matters, but one in particular is this one. I would say everyone should read Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson um, because it's a, it's, it's, it's a power of storytelling. It's the power of proximity. Um, Brian brings you, makes you proximate to, this, to these individuals. It makes you care. Uh, if we can do that more often, then the barriers around um, all the isms we, we understand in the world can begin to come can be can begin to come down. The walls can begin to come down. Brian does a masterful job of storytelling. I think everyone should read his, his book, Just Mercy. I love that you said that. The last school um, that I was leading was a middle school, and we got the YA version of that. And all of I think it was sixth or seventh grade read it, and it was it was so incredibly powerful to uh, listen to these kids engage wow. with the stories from that from that book. So thank you so much for bringing it, and thank you for being here today. This has been a great thank conversation. You. Like I said, you're a fabulous storyteller, and I'm probably going to go call one of my mentors right now and just ask him a few <laughs> questions and say thank you. So thank you. No, thank you. You're terrific. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on the More Than a Test podcast. If you found this conversation valuable, subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on your favorite podcast platform. At Amira Learning, we believe every child deserves a chance to become a reader, and we're excited to be part of this conversation. See you next week, and thanks for joining.